And as for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not let your holy one see corruption. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest what is said in the prophet should come about. Look, you scoffers, and be astounded and perish, for I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells you. As they went out, the people begged that these things might be told them the next Sabbath. And after the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who, as they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I've made you a light for the Gentiles, that that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. The word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. The disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. This is God's word. Amen. You may be seated. So we've been going through the book of Acts together, and we will continue going through the book of Acts together. If you haven't been with us, we preach through books of the Bible, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. So that is what we will do. Last week, we had a wonderful Christmas sermon. Uh, Paul preaching in Antioch, he took care of the sermon for us. And this week, we have a wonderful New Year's sermon. Again, that has not come from me, but from the Apostle Paul. The same sermon that ended 2022 will now begin 2023. And again, let me remind you, this is Paul's first recorded sermon in the book of Acts. Uh, He's with his mission team in Antioch, preaching at the synagogue. Last week, after reading from the Law and the Prophets, they said, Hey, you guys in the back, y'all have any word of encouragement you'd like to share with us? We have some visitors with us. Let's all see what they have to say. And Paul proceeded then to share the good news about how God kept his promise to send a Savior from the offspring of David. Jesus came. He died, he rose from the dead, he is the only begotten son of God, Psalm 2, the king who is king over all nations and all other kings. He's the same God who kept his promise in the Old Testament and the God who has now fulfilled his word in the New Testament. And this is the same God who will lead Main Street Baptist Church into a new year. Today's text causes us to grapple with some deep waters, theology, and salvation. And we have an invitation here for Jews to be saved, pardoned, freed by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we also see the rejection of the gospel and the word of the Lord being thrust aside. And we see Isaiah's prophecy again come to fruition. We read Isaiah 55. Paul turns to shine the light now to the Gentiles instead of the Jews. And we see God predestined Gentiles to be saved, elected before the foundations of the earth, granted the gift of repentance and faith. But maybe the biggest point to drive home this morning is verse 43. Verse 43. After the meeting of the synagogue broke up, many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas. Here's what Paul and Barnabas said to these folks who were sort of searching trying to understand the gospel. As they spoke with them, urged them to continue in the grace 
of God. They urge them to continue in the grace of God. I believe this morning, beloved, God is urging us from his word to continue in his grace. Whatever your current struggles are in the faith, whatever hardships may come in 2023, whatever temptations you will experience, God is saying this morning, live in my grace. Walk in my grace. Persist in my grace. Continue in my grace. How do we do that? But we learn it by the way he first introduced it to this church in Antioch or to the synagogue. Uh, three points this morning. I tried real hard to get three Bs. Couldn't pull it off. Y'all have any synonyms for the word continue? I couldn't come up with a good one. So we got a B, C, B. Beware, continue, believe. Beware, continue, believe. First one is beware. Here's the word of encouragement he's been giving to them, right? He spoke to them as brothers. If you just to remind you what happened last week, this salvation, this message of salvation came to us, brothers, to the Jews. God's promise was for us, and he kept that promise. We don't have to wait anymore. The Messiah has come. Have you not read Psalm number two, right? Kiss the son lest you perish in the way. Today I have begotten you, my son. He was speaking of Jesus. And this is a segue in the most important piece of Jesus' proof that he is the Messiah and King because begotten means to be raised up, to be enthroned, to be given an inheritance, to be king, which shows us and points us to his resurrection, that he did not stay dead but rose from the dead. And the next two scriptures that Paul gives us is an argument of his resurrection. Verse 34, Isaiah 55, he quotes, as for the fact, by the way, everybody knows it was a fact. We saw him risen from the dead. No more to return to corruption. Here's Isaiah 55. The Lord said through Isaiah, I will give you the holy and sure blessing of David. That's what Mariana read this morning. The, the same passage talks about come and buy food that you don't have money for and drink what you can't pay for, right? Uh, how can we partake? of that which we could never afford. The Lord has given an everlasting covenant out of his love and his sure blessing for David. David, he says, you know, was a witness and a leader for his people. And out of David will come a new covenant with a new glorious king who will give eternal life. Isaiah, twas foretold it, <laughs> right? Lo, how it rose. Uh, <clears throat> and he Moves on from Isaiah 55 to then Psalm 16, which we, was our call to worship this morning. Another psalm, another psalm of David. You will not let your Holy One see corruption. Jesus is the promised offspring of Isaiah 55. He's going to make all things new, and he achieved this everlasting covenant for the people of God by defeating death. This was the same psalm that Peter used in Acts chapter 2 when he preached at Pentecost. Psalm 16. It wasn't about David. It was about Jesus. Well, it was about David, but it was foreshadowing this, pro, this, this, this type of the one who was to come. He says, at my right hand, he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. My heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh also will dwell in hope. You have made known to me the path of life. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You will not abandon me, my soul, to Hades. Jesus died all the way dead. But then he rose from the dead, and he stands at the right hand of the Father to no longer see corruption. He is alive, and he's king. David died. Verse 36, David served God's purposes in his own generation. He was a king for the people of God, but he saw corruption. That's what Paul says. But he whom God raised up, son of, son of, son of, son of, son of, of David, did not see corruption. He rose from the dead. Why is it so important that Jesus rose from the dead? Because without resurrection, there's no verse 38 and 39. Look at verse 38 and 39. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man who rose from the dead, the one who has not seen corruption, the son of David, the Holy One of God, through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Let it be known, this man, and through the proclamation of his name, his death, and his resurrection, he pardons sins. 
He rose from the dead. He has the power to pardon every sin and death itself. He can do what the law could never do. He forgives sins. He frees us from everything the law could not achieve. God's law was a gift. Amen? It was a good thing. God wrote it for Moses, for the people. It was a good thing. But the law could never achieve this gift that God was giving through his son. God's law was good, but it could never cancel the sting of death and bring ultimate freedom. That word free is used twice in those two verses. It's the same word for justified. Justified. To stand sinless. No man can be fully justified by keeping the law of Moses. Under the law, all will continue to die and be slaves to sin and the flesh. Hebrews 10 tells us that. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. It can't do it. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sins. I've heard one theologian describe it this way. In the law, God gave us a highway of his holiness. that We could be on it, and we have these barriers to see his holiness and see who he is and see how we're not like him. But here's the deal. Our bodies are like boats. You can't drive a boat on a highway. The law revealed to us who God was and where we need to be. But there's something wrong with us. We don't belong on this highway, right? We're just stuck there. So Jesus came and transformed us into motor vehicles to give us true freedom to ride in the highways of God's holiness. We've been converted, regenerated, made anew, which is what makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The old covenant was based on moral instruction, which could never bring freedom in God's highway. The new covenant is based on God's priest after the order of Melchizedek, who is the holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted Son of God above the heavens. He and he alone can bring true freedom. Y'all heard the gospel yet this morning? This is good news. Good news for the people of God. Good news for the Jews. And yet after Paul had just delivered the best news in all the universe, explaining the freedom that Christ has won and pardoned for sin, you can almost see his demeanor change. Remember how he started preaching, motioning with his hand? I don't know what that means. Something like that, right? And uh, you can just see something shift in his, in his mind. After preaching in the gospel, that Jesus rose from the dead. He brings freedom. He says, beware. Beware. Beware lest what the prophets said should come about. Quoting Habakkuk 1 here. Beware means literally look, see, behold, be changed. He says, look, you scoffers, be astounded and perish, for I'm doing a work in your days, a work that you will not believe even if one tells it to you. This gift of freedom is free, but it is not a given. Not everyone will be saved. Not everybody will be given this gift. Many will not believe upon hearing the best news in all the universe. They will choose to stay under the law of Moses, scoff at Jesus the King, and in their rejection of God's Holy One, they will perish forever in hell. And we think, how? How is this possible? How does this happen? How can someone be so hard of heart to reject the best gift of all? Because salvation belongs to the Lord. And I think it's important for us to consider how Paul gives. This is an invitation to follow Jesus, right? I've never used Habakkuk 1 to invite anybody to follow Jesus. Have you? But this is where he goes. He urges them to respond, knowing that if they don't, they will perish and die forever. But you know, he doesn't turn the lights down. And say every eye bowed, or every eye closed, every eye bowed, and the synth, you know, starts playing, and and he tries to create some experience to draw the people. He do also doesn't raise his voice and run circles around the synagogue, and you know, act, act crazy. So we don't have hellfire brimstone. We also don't have love wins therapeutic gospel. What he does is he tells them the truth with all seriousness and reverence. 
and urges them to respond. But then he just leaves it. He just leaves it hanging in the quietness of the air. Does that seem strange? It's not much of an invitation. Beloved, we, we do this like every single week. Don't we? We are a church that unapologetically believes in the sovereignty of God over salvation. We can't save anybody, right? We can't preach hard enough or loud enough. We cannot manipulate people into some emotional response that looks like a profession of faith. I, from the pulpit, cannot twist God's arm into saving somebody here. Right? God saves people. Our job is to proclaim the only way that they can be saved, which is through the free gift of the Son of Man who rose from the dead and now pardons sins. God saves people. 16 verses of Just As I Am at the end of a church service has never saved anyone. If anyone has been saved, it's because God used the hearing of the word to prick a dead heart and they saw their sin alongside God's holiness and it led them all the way to the cross where they found a worthy substitute to die for their sin in their place and through the Holy Spirit, they were made alive, regenerated, converted, dead heart taken out, stony heart melted into a heart of flesh and he gave them the gift of faith and repentance and they were born again. That's how God saves people, right? So, you know, we look a little funny maybe to some because we're not big on altar calls, but we're big on God saving people. And we're big on the Great Commission. Nobody's going to amen that one? We're big on God saving people. I want God to save people. And perhaps through our preaching, He will. Beware. Number two, continue. As they went out, verse 42, verse 42, the people begged that these things might not be told them the next Sabbath, or might be told them the next Sabbath. They were excited, right? They'd heard the gospel. This sounds like a win to me. The, the congregation left intrigued. They wanted to hear more and discuss this further. Seeds appeared to be falling on good soil. They walked along with Paul and Barnabas and asking questions and wanting to understand the gospel that he had just preached. As a pastor, I have never had somebody beg me to know more about the gospel. I mean, this seems like good stuff here, right? So let me also take a moment, sort of caveat what I just said a minute ago. We believe God saves people, but we have no qualms with holding sinners by the hand as they wrestle with eternity. In fact, I would encourage all of us to do that, right? Um, Ichabod Spencer was a, a Presbyterian pastor in the early 19th century. Also Ichabod, another baby name we hadn't considered. Um, <clears throat> but a really, really wonderful pastor. You should look him up. Um, he wrote a book about many evangelistic encounters during his ministry, which is um, really enjoyable to read. Um, what he would do is he, he preached and addressed unbelievers every single Sunday from the pulpit. He would address unbelievers who may be there in the room. And then, almost every Sunday, he would then invite those unbelievers to what he would call like seeker meetings. And he would have a church member, usually the church member with the biggest house, host a meeting that any unbelievers can come to to ask questions about the sermon or the gospel that was preached. And this was very casual. It was like a dinner. They all walked around in this home and got to know each other, and they could ask the pastor or other church members anything that they wanted. And hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people were saved without any gun smoke and lights. God saves people by the hearing of the word, and it is a good thing to hold their hand while they wrestle. So don't hear me wrong. This is what Paul and Barnabas were doing. The meeting broke up, verse 43. They followed them, and here's that su summary I gave you earlier. They urged them to continue in the grace of God. And that word urge is a variation of the word for faith in the Greek, pistis, uh, idea of persuading someone of that which is trustworthy. 
And the word for continue is uh, from John 15, meno, abide, remain, but with the prefix pro, so it's adding some oomph behind remain. It means to remain permanently, to attach yourself to, uh, to cling tightly, to persist. So they were persuading them to latch on to the grace of God and not let go. Now, why the grace of God? Because unlike the law, right, grace actually saves people, doing what the law of Moses could not do. And the beauty of this counsel is that it never stops being applicable. If you're here today and you're not sure if you're a Christian, the best thing I can tell you to do is cling to Jesus. If you're here today and you've been a Christian for a few years, maybe relatively young in your walk with Jesus, a teenager, a young person, the best thing I can tell you, first Sunday of the year, cling to Jesus. If you're here today and you've been a Christian for 50 years, you were baptized in the Jordan River, here's what you need to do this year. Cling to the grace of God. Cling to the grace of God. The reason that this is still applicable to all of us wherever we are is because sin is sin and temptation still comes and self-righteousness never really leaves us. We have problems. And we try to substitute grace with whatever we can fill in the blank with that we think will give us true freedom. Cling to alcohol. Cling to pride and selfish ambition. Cling to your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Cling to money. It's all a lie. It has a false advertisement of freedom when you're a boat sitting in the middle of the interstate. You can't go anywhere. It will never give you the freedom that you think it will. Grace is the only thing that truly sets us free, and it's a gift so that none of us can boast. There's a song I hope that we'll learn someday. Maybe one of these days in 2023 we'll learn this one. It's called Not In Me. I'm just going to read you a few of the lyrics. Not In Me. No list of sins I haven't done. No list of virtues I pursue. No list of those I am not like can earn myself a place with you. No humble dress, no fervent prayer, no lifted hands, no tearful song, no recitation of the truth can justify a single wrong. No separation from the world, no work I do, no gift I give, can cleanse my conscience, cleanse my hands, I cannot cause my soul to live. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary load was borne by Him, and He alone can give me rest. Don't run to all the stuff that you think is going to finally satisfy you in 2023. There is nothing new under the sun. The same grace that brought you this far will lead you home. Don't leave Jesus. Cling to him. Cling to him. What did they do? Well, the next Sabbath, the whole city gathered. And when the Jews saw it, they were like, what? We've been doing this every week. And now y'all are all coming because you got a new preacher in town. Don't you love that? My first Sunday was probably the highest attendance we've ever had at a church, right? <clears throat> oh, I want to see what's going on here. And it frustrated the Jews because, was the, well, the power structure was imbalanced and they, they were threatened, but then also it was like, y'all came to listen to Paul? This guy just came in from nowhere and he's preaching some strange stuff. So then they decided to, out of jealousy, publicly contradict and revile Paul and Barnabas. These men and women who were recently seeking the truth of the gospel had left it. They did not continue in grace because of jealousy. Like the seed that was sowed on the ground was so quickly snatched away by a bird. You see why it's important that we be kind of slow to say, Hey, you're a Christian now! You're a Christian now! You're a Christian now! You're a Christian now, right? Because we don't know. We don't know. We want the numbers. We want the short-sighted view of success and revival. We want our church to multiply by 
50, 100 million people in 2023? We want to see something. We want to dunk every Ethiopian eunuch we can find who's willing to repeat the prayer after me. I heard a pastor once say, the best thing we can do when someone makes a profession of faith is to say, we'll see. Right? We'll see. We'll see. Verse 46, Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly when they saw this happening, and they said it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. They're the Jews, right? The message of salvation was for Israel. This is what the book of Romans deals with. What was the deal with Jews and Gentiles? Who was salvation really for? Jewish man first, but also for the Greek, Paul says. Romans 1, Ephesians 1, message was preached first to those who were near and then to those who were far off, strangers and aliens of the covenant of promise. Preached to both, the Jews first. But what did they do? Verse 46, since you have thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we're turning to Gentiles. Now, many of them did believe, Paul, Barnabas, you know, other Jews from Jerusalem, they did believe in Jesus the Messiah. They were uh, converted and, and made Christians. But by and large, starting with Jesus' own earthly ministry, he was rejected by those he came to save. The Jews said no thanks to the king that God sent. They thrust aside the word of God. They did not believe even if one should tell it to them, Habakkuk 1. And as a result, what Paul says, they judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. That's a staggering verse. They judge themselves unworthy of eternal life. God's word came to them. They thrust it aside. They judge themselves unworthy. Quick question, who is worthy of eternal life? Good. Somebody's still paying attention, right? Nobody. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all, in some way, have thrust aside the word of God. We are corrupt with sin. God only welcomes the sinless into his presence. God has provided a Savior, Jesus, who is the worthy one. So, what was happening here is that these unworthy Jews in Antioch saw the message of the worthy one, and they said, no thanks. Rejecting Jesus is a self-declaration of unfitness for the kingdom of God. Rejecting Jesus is a self-declaration of unfitness for the kingdom of God. It does not mean you wanted Jesus, but you just weren't holy enough, you know? That's not what it means. It means you saw his worth and you spit on it. Jesus uses the same word here, worthiness, in the parable of the wedding feast, Matthew chapter 22. There's a king preparing a wedding for his son, and he says to his servants, go invite everybody. They go out and invite people. Most of them just ignore him. And they ignore the servants. And many of them are actually murdered by the people that they came to invite. And they come back to the king, and the feast is ready. And here's what it says in verse 8 of Matthew 22. He said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. They rejected the messengers. They heard the invitation, and they scoffed, even though one told them the good news. Who will listen to the good news of God and be saved? Well, Isaiah 49 says it's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the, preser the preserved of Israel, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Now, let's going to have to do some thinking, right? This is huge. Before, like, Abraham, like, God chose Abraham. God said, you're my person. All your offspring are going to be my people. I'm making a covenant with you. But even before Jesus came, was crucified, and rose again, God had a marvelous plan, and Isaiah 49 said, It's too light a thing to only save Israel. I can't just save one tribe. It's not enough. My glory will multiply across every nation, across the whole face of the earth. Because God is way bigger than saving just the people with Abraham's last name. He wants them all. 
is he's glorious and he has an incredible plan unfolding to save the nations, which is the final point. I won't get all the verses here, but the final point is to believe. Believe. What do you think the Gentiles did when they heard this? Verse 48, when they heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Y'all heard some fireworks last night, right? Some of y'all didn't want to hear me. There's two kinds of people on 4th of July and New Year's Eve, people with kids and people without kids, right? You know who you were last night. You wake up, my baby, that'll be good. Here's what I think is happening in Acts chapter 13. We're just reading along, and it's like, boom, stick a dynamite, right? Boom, stick a dynamite. Fireworks. We're just like not, did, did you read what we just read? As many as were appointed to eternal life believed. This is another firework. And it's beautiful if we look at it. The Gentiles, non-Jews in Antioch, heard the gospel and rejoiced. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. What on earth is an appointment to eternal life? Some of y'all came to hear a New Year's Eve or a New Year's Day sermon. Instead, you're getting one on predestination. Okay? This is God's plan before the foundations of the earth to save, to save whoever he would save by his own divine appointment. He elects people unto salvation before they ever even hear the name of Jesus. He had Gentiles predestined for salvation before Gentiles were even on the radar, before they were even prophesied about. He had plans to save them. Listen, you can love it, you can hate it, you can't ignore it. It's Bible, right? And by and large, we should rejoice at Bible because Bible's good. Bible's God's word, right? Right? But antagonists will say, okay then, smart guy, preacher, why don't you tell me who the elect are? Okay. <clears throat> Let's read it again. As many as were appointed to eternal life did what? Who are the elect? Do you believe? Welcome to the family. It, it's not any more complicated than that, right? Those who believe show the fruit that God has chosen them before the foundations of the world to believe in Christ and be saved. Belief in Jesus is the evidence of predestination. Now, just in case I'm like ruining your New Year's Day here and you, you think I'm crazy, let me just read you a whole lot more Bible. John chapter 10. The sheep passage. He's the good shepherd. And you know what? He's talking to those people who, who were not believing in him. He says in verse 26, You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. The sheep that he picks believe in him. Verse 27, My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. And they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. 2 Thessalonians 2, but we ought to always give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because why? Because God chose you. Y'all sufferers out here in Thessalonica having a hard time, man, we weren't there very long, but God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Ephesians 1.11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. 2 Timothy 2.24, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. Where does repentance come from? God. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. One more verse, you ready? You don't have to flip far for this one. Acts 13, verse 39, 38 and 39. Let's go back. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, verse 39, and by him everyone 
who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. Paul believed in predestination, and that did not negate the mission to bring salvation to the ends of the earth, to be a light for the Gentiles. He preached his heart out. He wasn't afraid to use the word everyone. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Believe on Jesus today. We believe God can save anyone. So we preach that way, knowing he will not save everyone. We believe God can save anyone, and we preach that way, knowing he will not save everyone. And so we ask, well, why doesn't God save everyone? Instead, we should be amazed that God saves anyone at all. We had thrust aside his word. From the very beginning in the garden, we rebelled against him. We tried to make ourselves God, but in his incredible patience, as we spurned his holiness again and again and again and again, he decided to write a more glorious plan that includes redemption through the sacrifice of himself. Instead of crushing his own creation, he crushed his son in our place. He bore the full weight of God's wrath in our sin and died the death that we deserved. Three days later, God raised him up, and the Holy One did not see corruption. He ascended to the right hand of the Father to be a perfect high priest and intercessor for anyone who would call on his name and be counted worthy of eternal life. So, here's my Habakkuk 1 moment. How have you judged yourself? How have you judged yourself? Have you heard God's word and meekly and humbly come to the cross with nothing in your hands and believed on Jesus for the forgiveness of sins and obtained the free gift of freedom? Or have you thrust it aside? It doesn't matter how many sermons you've heard, who you came with today, whatever your story is, your background is. There is but one way to be saved. And if you have ignored this message, you have rejected this message. Let me say that again. If you have ignored this message, you have rejected this message. And the rejection of the message of salvation is, simply means you will not be saved. You will pay for your sins forever in hell. Here is a preacher standing before you now as Habakkuk 1 said would happen. They're going to tell you. And there's people who won't bat an eye and will scoff at Jesus. Which one are you? Are you the person who hears Jesus' name every single week, but you're, you're dead? Or are you the person that has heard his name? It's come. I invite you. Hear it. It's out in the air. Falls where it may. Come to Jesus. For those of you who are in Christ this New Year's Day, here's what you need to do. You need to be humble and thankful because you didn't save yourself. According to God's standards, justice demands you actually should have spent an eternity in hell paying for your sins against him, but because God had a glorious plan, he decided to save you. That should create the humblest people on the planet. Right? Why did God save you? Nothing you did. <laughs> Why are we saved? Because God is kind and glorious and patient and good. Not a day should go by in 2023 where we don't praise and thank the Lord for saving us from our sins and making us free. Second thing you need to know is that you are a light to the ends of the earth. People cannot be saved if you do not preach. You must proclaim the name of Jesus in 2023. Predestination does not prevent anybody from a Bible or with a Bible from fulfilling the Great Commission. Anyone who says different that predestination negates the mission is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. There's another word for that. It's called hyper-Calvinism. And quite frankly, I've never met anybody who actually believes that. So I don't know why we talk about it so much. Like, is that still a thing? Does anybody here know anybody that believes that? God's plan is to save people through a divine appointment, and we are that divine appointment. Keep it. Proclaim to them, as a light to the Gentiles, how they can be saved. Many will ignore you this year. Many may persecute you this year as you try to share Jesus. 
but the glory of the groom is worth inviting as many as you possibly can. Who will you share the gospel with this year? Finally, I urge you to continue in the grace of God and to encourage others to continue in the grace of God as well. You are saved by grace alone. You have no other place to go. Stay in grace. Don't go back to the law. Don't go to the other stuff you think is going to make you happy. New year, not new grace. Same grace. Good grace from the beginning, right? There are some of you who maybe you feel like you're hanging on to Jesus by a thread. The church is God's gift to turn that thread into a, a, a cable, a steel cable. Cling to him and help others cling to him. Who are you going to disciple this year as they run the race? Who do you see that's weary? Encourage them. Are you running out of steam? Look for someone to disciple you. Don't be too proud to ask for help.